Sorry about that. I uh, need to make darn good and sure that I uh, enable the microphone. Everybody can hear me right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about vertical antennas. So this is kind of a simplified uh, program and it'll go through some of the basics, but it at least gives you some food for thought. So why should some of the topics that we'll be talking about, why should I consider using a vertical antenna, different types of vertical antennas, why some vertical antennas require ground radios and others do not. That's a good question. And we'll see why, and it's obvious, it's pr pretty obvious why some of these really need uh, ground or these vertical antennas require radios. Other ones don't, and we'll find out why. If you have a small backyard, so, uh, the neat thing about uh, having a small backyard, um, that's also a pretty good candidate for sticking a, a vertical in there. But um, there's actually um, two different ways of looking at this. So we'll explore that. We'll be talking about vertical polarization, how we can talk to other buddies out there that are horizontally polarized. And I've been kind of surprised on some of the bands about some of the misunderstanding. I'm not going to say misinformation, but guys didn't quite understand why, when and why um, you might have losses between one antenna and another antenna talking to each other that are on opposite polarizations. So the big advantages, big, big advantage for, uh, for your uh, verticals is DXing. And the reason that DXing works really cool with these kinds of antennas is the low vertical takeoff angle. So that's that her, that angle from the horizon up to where that RF is either going out or coming into that antenna. So by having that lower takeoff angle, it gives you a longer distance between hops. In other words, for my 80 meter vertical out here that has about an 18 degree takeoff angle, that's almost the same as having my 20 meter um, a tribander, three element tribander up at uh, 80 feet up in the air, where as far as the distance it travels, they're almost pretty much the same. And that's the difference between the low takeoff angle on 80 meters as kind of as opposed to something that's on 20 meters that's way up in the air. The other thing that's good and bad is that this is an omnidirectional device. So it radiates and receives a 360 degree circle. It doesn't have any discrimination as far as where it's receiving RF or transmitting RF. So it can fit, depending on the type of vertical antenna you have, it can fit in a small lot and but on some type species of verticals, it takes quite a bit of real estate. And we'll find out a little bit more about why. But so antenna, so a vertical antenna is mounted at or very close to the ground level. So pretty close to the ground level. So the nice thing about that is you don't have to buy a $6,000 or $12,000 uh, um, tower to put it in. You don't have to have big tall trees around to hang it in. You can place the darn thing right at ground level. So let's look at disadvantages for a vertical. So it has much less gain. It doesn't have the same kind of gain that a Yagi will have. Uh, it's usually any, anywhere between one to three dB worth of gain. So that's pretty much the same as uh, a good old dipole. It's omnidirectional. Well, I said omnidirectional, uh, it, was a, it was an advantage. Well, it's also a disadvantage because it is not selective on, if you have a source of noise, if you have some electrical power lines that are off in some corner of where you end up live, living in, a, in the area, that noise from those power lines can also get in, easily get into that uh, vertical and cause noise. So it can be a noisy antenna. 
Uh, and sometimes, depending on, like if you're in the middle of the city, eh, with a lot of electrical noise around, it may not be uh, the right kind of choice for that kind of environment. Um, it can take up significant spaces. So when we talk about radials, when we get into that, we'll look and see and understand how much space that those radials can end up taking depending on what band that that vertical is operational on. Also, it is not good for NDIS, so near vertical instant. So the old good old 160 meter and 80 meter stuff where basically you blast off um, a bunch of RF up into the clouds and it bounces right back out of the ionosphere where it gives you a, a few hundred uh, miles worth of um, coverage there. This antenna will not work for NDIS type of coverage. Mike? No. Uh, you're, you don't have your presentation up. It's not up? Oh, it was up for a second, then you, uh, when you went to fix your mic. It... Oh, man. <laughs> Need to throw rocks at me. Try this again. I am, you needed to throw rocks at me earlier. Okay, so is it up there now? No. Is that affirmative? I missed the first end, first part of it. Yes, you are good. Okay. Okay, so everybody can see my program up there? Should be full screen. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Kind of got what I was saying about his bandages. So the big big thing is takeoff angles to remember out of that. And it is omnidirectional. Disadvantages, you don't have the gain like a Yagi has. It's pretty much like a, a dipole. And the bad some of the bad part is that it's also omnidirectional, so it can also pick up a lot of noise. And the final mark remark there uh, is not suitable for NBIS. And depending on the type of vertical you have, um, it um, uh, can take an awful lot, uh, take up an awful lot of yard space. So, talking about vertical takeoff thing, uh, normal old 20 meter Yagi up in the air, you're probably going to have a takeoff angle about 37 degrees. So that 37 degrees on 20 meters pretty much going to end you over in Michigan, Iowa. Um, uh, yeah, Kansas, um, down through Texas, Louisiana, that area. So comparable, a vertical for a, um, uh, has a, usually a, a takeoff angle around you know, 15 to 18 degrees. So that guy there is going to beat the crud out of trying to get across the United States. It's going to get you all the way over to the East Coast very, very nicely in one hop. So let's look at a little bit of drawing here. So here's a comparison looking at a three element um, uh, Yagi. And this shows the radiation pattern. So this guy here has a 37 degree takeoff angle, but you can see that that's a pretty good sized balloon. And it also is giving you about almost 11 a dB worth of gain. So it's not that bad as far as getting down to the, lo the lower elevations. Like, so if you get down to here, I think this is around 13 degrees, oh, about eight degrees worth of elevation, eight degrees. But you only have about two dB worth of gain, which is about the same as what you'd get from a dipole. So it can give you, get you some of the coverage down at low takeoff angles, but you're not in the sweet spot with all the all the big gain. So if we take a look at a vertical, here we have a takeoff angle of uh, 18 degrees, 18.8 .8 degrees on this, this particular guy. And if you look here on the easy mix um, dB or the, the amount of gain, you got about two and a half dB worth of gain. So it's not much for gain, but it gives you that nice low angle of radiation. 
Okay, so let's start dissecting different kinds of uh, verticals. We have what's known as halfway verticals, qu uh, quarter wave verticals, we have multi band verticals, and we also have non resonant verticals. So these are just the four kind of the top of the pickings there. There are lots of different kinds of verticals out there. But the main thing that all these different kinds of verticals provide you is that low, low takeoff angle. So here's some pictures. This one here, this is just like a monopole pole. It's probably just a single band vertical. Uh, it could also be a, a flagpole. If you want it, needed to hide it or make it look like something else, you could hang a flag on it. So that's just a single band um, monopole. The guy in the middle here, this is a multi-band. This is probably a Chris Craft uh, R8, either an R8 or an R9. So you can see the little radiators on the side there. You can see the uh, crisscrossing uh, pieces of wire on there. Those are called top hats. Adds a little extra capacitance there to counter out the, some of the inductance there. But, um, but this guy, oh, also there are traps. There's a set of traps here and there's another set of traps up here. So this will give you multi bands. Some of these guys will go from six um, meters all the way to 80 meters, depending on how much lumen, vertical lumen you wanna put up in the air. But it's pretty amazing how these guys can cover all these bands in um, um, pretty good style. It still has not a real big bandwidth. So you're gonna to have to set the tuning to where in the band you wanna operate from. But the key thing here is that all you got for counterpoises are these little tiny radials down at the very, very bottom. We'll get into what all of this means here. The guy, guy further, furthest on the right, that's a homemade vertical. And all he's done is strung some wire uh, vertically. The mast here is a fiberglass mast, so it's uh, non-metallic. And these vertical wires in here will provide uh, the whatever band is going to resonate from. And then you'll use some kind of uh, non-conductive cord to try, try and keep them nice and stiff. And then you have this round ring around here that keeps them all nicely separated so they don't touch each other. So here's one of the things that oh, we're going to get into. These are ground radios. So each one of these guys here is a piece of wire that goes out for some distance that makes up the other half of a full wave, um, like think of it like a full wave dipole. So half of the wire goes one direction, half of the wire goes the other direction. And then you have a piece of coax where the shield goes to the ground side or one side of it, and then the hot lead goes to the other side of it. So that's be the vertical part. But you can see this guy here takes up a fair amount of space and depending on what band you're operating is going to dictate how long. These are going to be a quarter wave long out there. So you can think of 160 meters being a pretty long stretch of piece of wire out there. So let's get into the details. So quarter wave vertical. So think of it this way, and I think everybody has enough knowledge about antennas to know that in order to get something to radiate, you have to think of it in the half, half wavelength. So generally all antennas, electrically, they need to be about a half a wavelength long. So on a quarter wave vertical, what they're doing is cutting that in half. You have a quarter wave length of it going vertical and another quarter wave of it setting out in a counterpoise. So that counterpoise can require, depending on how much how your ground is, what kind of ground you are, you have, moisture content, amount of wire in it. You may need somewhere between 30 to 60 ground radios to really make that antenna work, work really well. But that's going to end up giving you the counterpoise to make that antenna work as if it's a, uh, a half wave antenna. So optionals, options. Um, you can also take those radios and elevate them. Um, I think you've seen Bill go through there and on his, uh, when he puts that up for field day, he always has that big vertical out there 
and all this vertical is all raised about a meter off the ground. And there's a body of information that you can read up on that will tell you uh, what effect that will give you and what the optimal elevation is there to get the best out of it. For multi-band uh, verticals that are quarter wavelength, those radios are gonna have to have chunks of wire in there that are the right length for each band that you plan to operate that vertical in. So that can make things a little bit complicated on that, all that extra wire you have to throw out there and keep them separated so they're not touching, touching each other. Um, so all of this will, depending on what you get for takeoff angle, you know, it depends on the ground, the number of radials that you put out there. Here's another little interesting thing is that for guys that have done soda and actually used a vertical out there, uh, especially like for 20 meters and 15 meters, uh, you can put up a quarter wave vertical and then you usually run at least one, if not two wires off of that for a ground plane, uh, for a counterpoise. And the direction that you point that wire is the direction that your RF is going to go. So if you point that thing or you're up on top of a mountain and you point that thing out to the east, it's going to head for the east coast. That's how, how the stuff's going to work. And then it's blind. It doesn't hear anything else going uh, north, south, or west. It won't hear anything. So quarter wave. Generally, the, it's real easy to match the quarter wave vertical. The feet point is somewhat around 50 ohms, so you can match it with a piece of coax. You don't have to have a special matching network to do that. So the bad news about a quarter wave is that it's going to eat up a lot of yard space with a lot of embedded wire in the ground. And I know some, some guys, they've gone through there and trenched that into the grass, and it just all blends into the grass. They can mow right over it, never have a problem with it. It looks like just like grass out there. So if you have the extra energy to do that, you might give that a try. So again, this is what a ground plane, a naked ground plane without any dirt setting on it with the, all the wires going out from that center point. I don't know on this one how many ground wires it is, but you can see that it's an awful lot of them. And I would guess this is kind of a deserty air, deserty area that probably has pretty low conductivity in the ground. Let's talk about halfway verticals. Halfway verticals. Um, so it's kind of like you can think of it a little bit like a dipole, um, but it's not really quite a dipole. It's really more like a infed uh, antenna. So you have a a full length quarter wave piece of aluminum up in the air. And, but you just, when an infed, you still need a little bit of counterpoise. It could be either use some of the, um, uh, some of the coax and the shielding on the coax for the counterpoise, or what generally what they do, you can look on the bottom here, is that you will end up uh, having a coax choke to make sure no RF goes down back out the uh, shielding of the coax, and you'll have these little dinky ground wave or uh, these little uh, chunks of wire that sticks out the side there that acts as the ground, or ground uh, counterpoise on that. So that's the way they usually do it on a half wave. Generally, it's a 50 ohm uh, matching, so you don't normally need a matching transformer. Uh, some of the ones that are more um, high-end ones will have a built-in matching transformer that will give you a uh, 50 ohm load, but that's more on your multi-band stuff. It's a lot taller. It's a lot taller. Uh, so you know, think of these guys, when you put them in, they're going to be a half wavelength tall. So when you do that, you're going to, you can fit in this backyard, but you're going to need to guy it. That's the key thing. You need to make sure you have the space to guy it, but it will fit in a very small footprint in a backyard. So these are a couple other pictures, the closer up pictures where you can see the full length of a multi-band. So same concept, these guys are made up, made so they're uh, 
a half wavelength. These dies have traps in it. These have capacitance hats in it to kind of get the right impedance. So it all comes out this right impedance as it comes out the bottom. And a lot of these have a little bit of a matching transformer down at the bottom to take care of uh, the impedance mismatch. So multi-band verticals. It's a very versatile antenna uh, that supports multi-bands. You can get these things if you want to spend the money uh, where they can cover everything from 80 meters down to six meters. Um, be a little cheaper and only go to four, 40 meters and maybe chop out some of the warp bands in between there if you need to get something a little less expensive. But it's really amazing the coverage that you do get out of the bands on, on those things. Um, so again, they use a small counterpoise, those little wires that stick out the, the sides there, can fit into a really small backyard, but they are also very tall, so it will require guy wires in there. So some of the people out there, and you'll see this sometimes on the expeditions. Well, they'll bring out a 43 foot vertical and stick it up in the air. They use a matching transformer at the bottom of it so they can run it on different bands and match it up. Uh, it will, it can cover with the right matching transformers and stuff. Uh, anywhere from 80 meters through 10 meters. And it's, you see it a lot of times on de-expeditions, guys doing this kind of stuff. And if you live in a trailer house or you have a bunch of restrictions around your housing, you can stick one of these things up and camouflage it with an American flag at the very top of it. So here's one of the things that I brought up about talking to one antenna is horizontal and one is vertical. Generally, the loss is around 20 dB for line of sight communications when you have one antenna vertical and the other one horizontal. So that's line of sight. When you're talking kind of HF and you're putting RF through the ionosphere, the ionosphere is going to kind of scramble things up. So what comes out of the ionosphere after that first bounce, it may not be entirely horizontal, it may not be entirely vertical, it may be something in between. So guys that run the stuff through, um, you know, multiple hops through the ionosphere, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, sometimes they, I've seen it on 80 meters done in VIS, where there might be some differences. I've, I've had, had some differences between a horizontal and a vertical, and that had to do a little bit with polarization, but that's just kind of a single hop straight up and down. So. Okay, don't forget two meter stuff and 440 and 220. I mean, the verticals, I'm sure you've seen these all the time, that old uh, ground plane, uh, verticals and J poles, those are all vertically polarized guys that that's the same stuff that we've been talking about here on the HF, same principle. So here's one thing that I'll mix into it. There's um, for a number of, for a fair number of years, there's some emerging technology coming out called vertical arrays. And these arrays can then be anywhere from three, four, or eight vertical elements. And they use a concept called phasing, where they can phase the RF going to each one of these uh, vertical elements and cause the either reception or the transmission to be directional. Again, this is low angle stuff. So that means with the right kind of um, controls on an array like this, you can have, you can cause that thing to be directional. You don't have to have a physical rotator to move anything physically. Electronically, you can move that 
directionality all through electronics. It's also a way of drastically re reducing the background noise. So a vertical, a normal vertical will receive stuff from all 360 sides, 363 sides. With a array, you can end up, it will null out the stuff on the sides, stuff in the back end. And it's really amazing. The next thing, the next bullet there, the gain. Here you actually come up with a vertical antenna that has some real gain to it. Depending on the arrangements that you have and the type of uh, preamps and hardware, you can get anywhere from eight to 13 dB worth of gain. And that is absolutely marvelous. Um, but in order to put these guys up, they're a bit expensive and it can also take a fair amount of real estate. The actual, and the aluminum is getting insanely expensive these days to put stuff like this up. But also the electronics is a very complicated and very proprietary and it, um, and people are asking a premium price for it. But it's really an amazing system when you, when you walk into a world of using vertical arrays. And I think you've heard me say this before, it's not always the amount of gain that you get, but it's how you end up turning off the noise that you don't want to listen to. Even if you don't get a whole lot of gain, the biggest thing here is you can turn off noise from other places that you don't want to listen to and thereby your perceived receive gain is way up there. Really nice system. So let's wrap things up here. As I've talked said many, many times, the biggest advantage for a vertical is that low takeoff angle. The less hops you have to make, the less losses you're going to get, the more distance you're going to get out of it. It's great for DXing. Uh, verticals have about the same gain as dipoles. <laughs> pretty sad as far as gain. Verticals are omnidirectional and can pick up uh, electrical noise, unintended electrical noise from any direction out there. So that's one of the reasons that it's also uh, a little on the noisy side. Some multi-band verticals can fit in a small backyard. They're still a half wave uh, in, in elevation and height. So whatever the upper band that you're going to get to, if you want to get to 80 meters, you're going to have a lot of vertical elevation there to, to get to that. And um, the better ones are anywhere you can buy those things. They'll cover 80 through 6 meters and everything in between. Pretty, uh, pretty amazing. A half inch wave vertical can require a very extensive radio ground system. So I kind of showed you some pictures there and you can imagine stringing out all that wire and the cost of all that copper wire gets pretty expensive to get that a good ground plane underneath it. Elevated ground system can significantly improve the gain and make it uh, a lot more effective when you elevate those verticals. But you also so, that- um, Mike, question? Yo. Yeah. It's the, it, just like your slide says, just reemphasize, it's the quarter wave that needs the extensive ground, not, yes. not the half. Yeah, wave. It's, okay. it's the quarter wave, quarter wave. Okay. So Thanks. sorry if I misspoke there. Yep. So it's the, <clears throat> because that, that radio system acts as the other half of the counterpoise. Um, so the, another positive side thinking about this is for a vertical system, you don't have to have a tower. You don't have a big honking tower. You don't have to plunk in, pour in all that concrete. Uh, building a big tall tower and putting up all that hardware for a tower. Also, you don't have any really support structures, so you don't worry about string and uh, wire and stuff, um, or actually um, um, cables and stuff up in the trees in order to support your uh, dipoles. That's kind of a positive part. So there are many, many different forms of verticals and then different varieties and you can go out there and look around and see if um, see what see what you looks good look at the reviews and enjoy um, um, playing with that I 
I have one vertical around. I actually have two verticals around here. One of them I use all the time. It's a really a cool machine there. And another one I just use spotting just uh, when I'm kind of looking around for something to go after. Uh, it's kind of my a spotter that I don't have to rotate a beam around to find it, find anything. So that's all for this program. And so I'm open to um, anybody's, uh, let anybody's comment there. Let me get back here to. Mike, I was gonna mention that even if you have a horizontal antenna, um, having a vertical is is advantageous because um, as your polarization does tumble when it hops, um, one of the antennas is going to be closer to the polarization of the wave that's going to come down to you. And in fact, some rigs, you know, I, I won't mention manufacturers, can actually allow you to listen to both antennas at once. Um, so that you can hear the stronger signal, whether it's coming in over the vertical or the horizontal polarized antenna. Um, and it essentially doesn't eliminate QSB, but it makes QSB a lot more tolerable because QSB is usually caused by the ionosphere refracting your, your wave to the opposite polarization of what your antenna is. So on our implementation on the flex, it's pretty naive. You can put one antenna in the right ear and one antenna in the left ear simultaneously. So it kind of shifts from one ear to the other. Um, and honestly, it was pretty amazing during the sweepstakes that I ran in November, it made a huge difference. Yep, that, that is absolutely right. And that, like you said, if you got both a horizontal and vertical antenna, if you got an electrocraft or um, electrocraft or a flex, um, both of those receivers have that stuff built into it. So you can run diverse, diversity and listen to whichever antenna is picking the best stuff out. Or you can even swap them yourself if you know you can have an AB switch and switch between them and try and keep on the one that's that's getting you the best signal out of there. So of having a decent vertical is a good thing to add to your stable of antennas if you have the real estate and money and, and everything else. Yep. yep. Any other questions or observations? Thank you guys. Appreciate that. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Hey, so Drew, vertical would fit very nicely in your backyard. Yes. I have one in my backyard. It's my main antenna. I've got a gap challenger and it performs okay. 80 is a little narrow on it, but it doesn't take up much yard space at all. Um, you know, and it only takes like three radials to put into the ground. So uh, it's been a pretty good antenna so far. So yeah, a, a small backyard in the city, it, it's a good choice. I did have one question. Hey, Mike, if we go back to the, the quarter, the, the photo, the desert photo with the, a bazillion radials, mm -hmm. is are you cutting some of them to certain wavelengths and others to different wave or different lengths for different wavelengths? Okay, on your vertical part, if you want to make it into, if you, if you can do the matching to it, you can cut the ground radios for different, or, or if you even put traps, if you use a trap in your vertical part of it, mm -hmm. then you can go through there and cut the wire for 40 meters and for another set of okay. wires for 20 meters and another set of wires for 15 meters. Okay. Yeah. And that's the way you will end up getting a resonant ground that will work nicely with that antenna. Okay. Actually, a resonant ground plane. And just a rough guess, it looked like there were about 60 radials in that picture. <laughs> if you counted a quarter of them and multiply. That's, that's good to know. It looked like a, looked like a <clears throat> lot of money. and uh, It did. I, I have a friend that put in a 160 meter of vertical. <laughs> you can imagine the amount of wire that went into uh, building a really good ground plane. Well, he used to work for Boeing. Uh, yeah. 
And so back in those days, he could take and pick up wire scraps mm -hmm. and he ended up picking up, um, I don't remember what it was used for, but you know, long, long runs of school wire. And so he was, he worked out very, very well for putting a magnificent ground plane for that thing. <laughs> I was going to ask if he was an investor in a copper mine or something. Yeah. <laughs> Chilean? Yeah, is he Chilean or something? Oh, he's, he's an old, ancient, crusty guy that was in the right place at the right time when he was thinking uh, 160 meters. <laughs> Nowadays, couldn't we just take pennies and lay them out there? Nobody wants <laughs> pennies. Probably cheaper. Sure they're in copper? <laughs> <laughs> hey, actually, on the um, elevated, so on the the ones you talk to that uh, any more guidance on if you have an elevated vertical and it's got the, you know, the classic ground plane, you know, radials coming up mm -hmm. is, are there some that, you know, should, should only be at a certain height or if you have to stick it up on your roof or something, is, are you going to make a compromise or. I've seen guys that, that you got to do your own reading on it and Right now, I don't remember all of the, the good and the bad, but I've seen guys that really like just putting them up at a meter above ground, but that means maintaining the ground underneath there is pretty insane. I've seen other guys put them up at six feet up above the ground, so that means they can get underneath there and do all the maintenance that they work, that, or that, that any maintenance on the ground to, without causing any problems. I don't, I don't recall what the magic bullets are as far as elevation above ground and all the things that it gives you. My recollection is that at some point in time, they decouple from the ground when the yeah. radial gets up high enough, you know, based on percentage of wavelength of what you're transmitting at. And then it starts to behave much more like an L-shaped dipole um, than it does a vertical because that's essentially what you're building at that point. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, that's not, sounds good. That's you know, but you mentioned soda. That's my main soda antenna. Is a is a uh, there's a quarter wave element for um, where's the quarter wave? Yeah, it's a quarter wave element for the vertical piece of it um, that I have that looks like a tent pole, and then I have a quarter wave uh, piece of wire on a kite winder. Um, that I have sticks that I can elevate it around three feet above the ground from the uh, uh, from the feed point. Yep. Same, same, same formula that I use. And I've actually gone to two wires that gives me just a little bit better gain. Yeah. And you don't even, I mean, you do it right and you really don't even need to use the tuner on your on your rig because, I mean, you're pretty close. Actually, I bring a little two by three inch um, um, antenna analyzer with me. Mm. And so I just do the final tuning as far as I know what the length is for what frequency it is mm -hmm. for the vertical part. But when it comes to the horizontal part, the ground plane, that I end up adjusting the length a little bit back and forth to get me the right uh, match for 50 ohms. Yeah, I put, in order to get me close, I put some colored shrink tube on the uh, radial wire that the, each color is a different band that gets me close. And then depending on the terrain, you can put wraps or pull wraps off of the kite winder in order to make it a little bit longer or shorter. Okay. Uh, do the radials um, have to go in a straight line? No. No, but generally they need to point in the direction that you want to end up talking. Especially on the multiband ones. I mean, really, it doesn't, you know, uh, if you don't have enough yard space, you can kind of zigzag it back on itself with a lot of those as well. Any other comments? No, I think I've stolen enough of your presentation, Mike. No, <laughs> I, I'm looking, always looking for a conversation because I hate listening to myself. <laughs> so, Anthony, it's yours. All right. Thank you, Mike.
wonderfully interforming as always. Uh, any other uh, business for the before I wrap things up? Just a curiosity question. Anybody mm -hmm. have any uh, antenna damage due to our wonderful week of weather? Yeah. Some of my, not, not any HF antenna damage, but uh, the uh, uh, pole on top of my house that was holding all the wireless gear fell. Um, and my 900 megahertz Yagi got all bashed up. So that was not fun. Sorry for that. It is what it is. I should have battened it down better. <laughs> that, yeah. that problem has been fixed now. So the uh, little repeater that we put together for the Silk Creek area um we had some antenna damage the uh 900 meg yeah 900 mega a megahertz laurel link uh mm -hmm. that antenna uh it's a th little three element yagi uh, that that kind of kind of damage from all the snow and ice there we actually pulled pulled, pulled it off there pulled the little pigtail out a little bit and just stuck a little simple nine megahertz dipole on that and that worked just just as good as a three element yagi did this one's a little longer <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> but you can see some of the elements got bent up i tried to bend them oh. back into place but they're broken so mm -hmm. well so that's a, a 200 dollars investment to replace well they come in uh, it's actually only a hundred dollar investment but they only sell them in two packs <laughs> <laughs> so you got to spend 200 <laughs> ouch ouch at least it wasn't the radio those radios are really rare right now so they're going for a lot of money but all of my wire antennas yeah i picked up a lot of fair amount of ice and snow on them mm -hmm. but i was able to snap them all that fell off my um uh, big uh yagi my uh, x7 up on the tower um, the in between elements and stuff like that and where all the feed line goes through there that stacked up with a whole bunch of snow and it took me about three days to get that knocked out of there so I could uh, use it I could get it up work on 20 meters but 15 was gone and uh, 10 meters was kind of dodgy there so it took me about a at least five days to get it dethawed enough where it could use it. And then I think I got some water in one of the balance there, but it's kind of dried out now. You just needed to key down your amp for a couple hours, Mike. That'll heat it up <laughs> there and get the ice off. I need an amp that can handle that kind of key down. <laughs> no comment. I know. <laughs> just money. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for I think the I... stories. I think I lucked out because I had uh, my my vertical did just fine through the through the stuff, and then my my dipole I haven't gone around to putting it back up since the last bit of weather that we had because <laughs> I had to have a bunch of my trees <laughs> thinned out <laughs> to to take out the uh, the widowmakers out of there. So it was like <laughs> by the time that that got done, it started getting goopy enough in the in the lawn to try and get the antenna rehung so it's been sitting in the in the shops waiting for uh next weather break so <laughs> to this rate by the time i get around to doing that i'll be time to take it down for like field day or seven qp and yeah anything else guys otherwise i'm probably going to get out of here I wish you a warm January. What's left of it? <laughs> All right. Uh, and it, so fun fact, turns out that our next meeting falls on the, uh, the next official holiday of the, uh, of the year. So uh, we'll see you all on uh, Washington's birthday. Okay. And mine. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> happy birthday. Yep. Cool. All right. Take care, everyone. Yep. See you guys. Okay. Bye. See you guys later. Okay. Bye. Good night, all. Bye. Bye.